Hey guys, how's the audio? Can you hear okay? All good? Thank you, John. get this kicked off got a few folks on welcome to our saturday together so listen um today uh i was going to talk about some ways to um break out of a rut if you sort of get yourself into a rut and i know that happens to me or that's happened to me many times um, and it's actually a question that a lot, I, I get a lot of questions from, from, uh, from you all around some things to do, because you sort of get stuck in the things that you're used to and you feel good about things that you learn, which is all good. But every once in a while, you just sort of need to push your comfort zone a little bit. And, uh, it's not always sort of super obvious on how to do that. And everybody has a million different ways to do that, which is good because there's always going to be <laughs> always going to be choices on um, on how to do that. So I'm going to share five of mine today, um, and uh, I'd be curious to see if uh, if you've tried any of these, and um, you know, join in on the chat and let me know if there's other things besides uh, besides what you're hearing that's worked for you, because um, maybe something I haven't heard of either, and I'm always looking for stuff that's new. Um, okay, well, before we jump in, um, it's kind of a nice overcast, cloudy day here in Nashville, Tennessee, technically Franklin, just south of Nashville. Um, but let me know in the chat where y'all checking in from. Um, love to see where, uh, where you all are right now and uh, what's going on in your world. Yes, Mark, the best slump buster is a new guitar. Yeah. <laughs> Need more guitars. Okay. Western Canada. Way to go, John. I lived just north of Seattle for a long time, so I was up in Vancouver and um, Whistler a lot up until a couple years ago. Love it. Very beautiful. Okay. So let's talk about some ways to get out of comfort zone. And, and like I said, let me know... Uh, let me know uh, some of your ideas on the things that you've done um, to get you out of your own slumps. Okay. Number one for me, take your pick and throw it away for a week. Just don't use a pick. Just don't use one. Um, if you're, if you're like me, um, you may like to take a guitar, you know, in the TV room and just have it on the couch. <laughs> just mess around all the time. And I would do that when I was younger um, a lot. And and when I was first starting out, you know, you sort of have like two picks in your room or in your house and you lose them all the time or they're in the laundry. Um, so for a long time, I would just sort of, you know, I would just go without a pick for a while. And it was, uh, it was actually a great development tool for me to um, work on my sort of just finger style, you know? And, uh, you know, stuff just comes to you. You know, the whole thing about getting yourself out of your comfort zone is that you're creating opportunities for new things to happen, um, new ideas to come into your head, and actually physically new neurons, new neural activity to, to connect in your brain. Um, 
and uh, and you're just creating the opportunities for those things to happen. So you have to shake things up. Um, and it could be something as little as just going without your pick, you know. Um, and so that's number one. Ann Arbor, Michigan, Daniel. Welcome. Mark, good to see you again. Dallas, got family in Dallas. And Plano. All right. Um, okay, so number one, go for a week without a pick. I don't know what your practice routine is, um, but just um, if that's something that would be new for you, just try it. Try it. New things pop into your head and you force yourself to um, approach the guitar and approach your playing a little bit differently. And a lot of people actually don't use picks. And for a long time, you know, I would do that and I would just hold my fingers as if I had a pick and you sort of use the round of your fingernail when you're strumming. I did that for a lot of years. I sort of, you know, if, if I'm playing live and my pick drops, you know, a lot of times I'll just keep going like that anyway. It's, it's, you know, just another way. If y'all watch um, Andy, um, Andy guitar shop demos, he's out of Portland. You see him on reverb all the time. He's awesome. He doesn't use a pick. That's what he does. He just uses his fingers all the time. Um, okay. So go for a week without a pick is number one. Number two, is don't allow yourself to use a cowboy chord um, or a basic bar chord, right? So um, cowboy chords, you know, they're the first the first position chords that we all know, right? C, A, D, E, G, and so on, right? Just so just tell yourself, I'm not going to use those, and I'm not going to use this full chord. And I'm not going to use this full chord. Um, and uh, so whenever your song that you're playing with is calling for an E chord, you got to find something else. Even if they play on the record, I'm just saying, find something else. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a lots of other voicings that you can do around all these chords, right? So, you know, what's, um, here's one for an E that I like to use a lot. Um, whoops. So, you know, this is just taking an E chord and sort of making it into a D-shaped E chord, right? So this is also an E, right? But you sort of take the um, this part of the D shape of your E chord, you leave that open string that string open and you sort of cover over on these two so your e chord is you don't have a major third in it right that's one you can make an e7 right so you make your d shaped e7 like this right um use open strings you know you're not allowed to use this b e chord so you can do this, just one, two, one, two, three, right? If you need a C, you can make that into your Jimi Hendrix C with your major third on top. You're sort of making that into a, a G shape C, right? So you're barring across on the fifth and you're adding on the seventh on the fifth string. Maybe you grab the C note down there, right? Likewise, if you have an A, here's a way that you can play an A very easily. It's similar, but it's not the same. You're barring over on the second fret and you're grabbing the E and the B string at fifth, at fifth fret. That's your Pete Townsend. Or just a single note. That's the Beatles. Right. So there's, and then the other shapes that we showed work for all of them. Like A, you could do with this D shaped A as well. Just like we did with the E. 
You can play your A up here with an open A string this time. So that's one that's worked for me too. It's forced, it forces your hands to approach a chord from a different position. Um, and you want to break up those established neural connections that you have that are automatic pilot. You'll be, you'll of course go back to your normal cowboy chords and throw those in and use them. You won't lose that, but you want to gain something and you want to gain a new perspective, new positions for your hands. And it gives you a different launching off points for soloing if you're leaving that. So it's just shakes it up, right? We're out of our comfort zone. Just a little, just a little. Okay, so don't allow yourself to play a cowboy chord or a basic bar chord was number two. Um, number three, um, this one was interesting for me. Um, when you solo, play, try just playing the vocal melody. And it sounds sort of boring, um, but in the olden days, um, you know, like the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and sometimes into the 60s, when you would hear pop songs, um, when it would launch into an instrumental section or a solo section, they would stick to the to the melody. So you'd have the vocal melody that would sing over the verses, and then the soloing instrument would sort of mimic the vocal melody. Um, and uh, a couple things happen with that. It's just another, It's it takes your ear is still interested because it's a different type of instrument that's playing that melody. So it is a change and it keeps you interested. Um, and from a guitar player's perspective, I found that, you know, when a voice is singing a melody or a voice is singing a pattern, it's different. It's, they choose different places to go and the inflections are different. And when you try and mimic that on a guitar, it forces you to do things a little differently. Like pre-bends seem to sort of pop up a lot, right? Um, what can I think of uh, examples? Like, so a song I love to play a lot is that Robert Plant, um, Big Log, you remember that song? played the vocal melody on that. See, there was a pre-bend, right? There's another one. You know, it just, it, it forces you to do something different, right? Um, what's some other ones? Yeah, I was playing this earlier. He's awesome. Oops. Right. It's it just forces, at least for me, it forces you to do things a little bit differently, and the inflection points are different, and it just gives you new vocabulary, you know, vocal bends. When you're bending on guitar, usually when you're sort of in the blues rock genre, which I know many of us are, you know, when you bend a note, you're sort of always bending a whole step or so, you know, two, two frets worth, right? Right? But when you're, a lot of times the vocals, they're not doing a, they're doing, they're doing like a single or a half, half a step bend, if that kind of thing. And if you sort of mimic that with your playing or use that, um, to try and sing your guitar solos. I think it just changes, um, uh, it just changes things up for you. It does, it does for me. And it still happens, you know, they did that in the old days a lot with the melodies. Um, but it even happens sort of in more modern genres, you know, Weezer, Weezer does that a lot. Um, what's that song? Yeah. Whoops. You know that song, Island in the Sun? Right? 
but that's he does that in the solo. Like he just he sings the melody, he plays the melody in the solo, and it's great. It sounds awesome. Um, what's the other one that they do? In the Blue Album, um, Buddy Holly. You know, it's just I won't belabor the point, but you, you get it. Like it, it still works. And and I'm saying like you don't always have to when it comes to your point of doing your guitar solo you do not always have to you know launch into pentatonic band world you don't you can choose to play the melody or maybe play half the melody and then finish it off with something you want to build off of that so okay so that's number three play the vocal melody so the three things we've talked about so far first throw away your pick for a week just play your guitar without a pick Second, don't allow yourself to play a cowboy chord or a standard bar chord. Use find other shapes whenever it's your turn to play an A or a C. Just don't use the cowboy chords. Three, play the vocal melody. We just talked about that. Four, um, listen to another instrument um, and play their parts on the guitar. Here's what I mean by that. Um, my dad loved and loves um, big band music. Um, and he had like Glenn Miller and Benny Goodman. Um, and I always thought it was lame when I was growing up. Um, but you, you just listen to it and it's in the house and you're like, you know, it's kind of cool. So Benny Goodman, for example, he plays clarinet. Um, it's a wind instrument. Um, I can't think of a, a an instrument that is less like a guitar, probably, <laughs> than a clarinet. Um, anyway, so one day I just said, you know, I'm going to sit down and listen to some of his songs and see if I can play some of his parts, some of his clarinet parts on the guitar. And what happens is, similar to the voice, like, they approach their instrument from different perspective. Um, and you know, it's jazz, it's not rock. Um, so of course it's going to be different from that place, but still like what, what they choose to play and the runs that they do are different than the runs that you would typically do on a guitar. And I think part of that is because, um, part of that is because of the, uh, you know, we play riffs on the guitar a lot of times based on where our hand and our position is and what's the sort of vocabulary that's accessible to us at that moment you know um i remember seeing a john mayer video of that um where he talks about you know a lot of the riffs that he does is because you know his hand is in there and he's working from this position so if you don't allow yourself to do that and you still want to play in minor pentatonic maybe you don't maybe you don't start there you Start from the bottom part of the equator. If you think of that as the equator of your of your of your key, like you wouldn't start to you wouldn't look for that riff up here. You would look for that riff down here. I am getting back to the other the clarinet thing with that. So the clarinet or saxophone, you know, anything that's playing sort of single note um, stuff they're going to be approaching their instrument and their little runs based on what it is that they're, you know, is available to them at the moment and the vocabulary. Right. So, you know, I was playing with, um, I'm not a jazz guy. Right. But I was, I was just trying to push my comfort zone a little bit. And remember that song Savoy, I think it's called or stomping at the Savoy. It's got a, uh, already but it's got this great um change in it it goes like this and you're back All right so it's a you start up here and you're just moving from fifth you know your the fourth you're moving from fourth so you do that chromatic up down and then what's the fourth from there here and the fourth
fourth from there, and the fourth from there, and then back to your turnaround chord. Okay, so that was the bed, but what Benny Goodman plays on 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 the clarinet um, over this part, and that's a uh, what is that F sharp ninth is how I'm playing it, um, but he does. Whoops. Right, and that's over this. So he's playing in the F sharp nine over the B seven. But what was interesting to me, I discovered, is when he did that. So that's the next chord. He just outlined the triad for the chord that you're moving to, but you're not there yet. It was interesting to me, but you know what I mean? It's like, I, I don't, it was different. It was a different way of how he's approaching the soloing. And so now you can integrate that into what you're playing. So. Zach, good to see you, buddy. Yeah, melodies, it's fun. It's fun. It just takes you to another place and it's perfectly fine. It's a lot in country music too. Um, and it's how you apply touch to all of that. You know, it's it's still... It's still all good. All right. So that was listen to another instrument other than a guitar. And um, I would recommend wind instruments like sax, clarinet, um, but it could be anything. Um, or pick one of the one of the hands on the piano where they're playing single note stuff. Um, just try that and work something out on guitar. Um, it just forces you into different places. Okay. Um, number five. Number five. Um, this is interesting. Play the solo that you know from a different position. Or in other words, question what you already know. Question those parts that you learned a long time ago um, that, you know, when you were younger and you think you mastered. That's bitten me a lot. Um, you know, I do these videos a lot of like, you know, how to play this song like the record, you know. Um, and uh, a lot of time before I would sit down and try and teach that, I had to check myself a lot. I have to listen to the listen to that song again, listen to what I've always played and really challenge myself. Is that really is that really it? And a lot of times you'd be surprised you find it's actually, you know, I was playing it from a position mm -hmm. that still works. It's still sort of the same notes. Um, but you can tell if you wanted to play it like like he's playing it, you have to start it from a different position. Um, you know, one of those that just popped up for me the other day is um, this is a very simple riff um, that one of the first hits from the Rolling Stones. Um, uh, what's it called? The last time, right? So I, I always learned that. I was like, oh, that's just right down here. Sort of do that riff all the time so it's got to be there right but it's not it's not it's actually up here and there's some hammer-ons and that kind of thing i'm not going to go too deep into that because i'm probably going to do a video on that um but but you'll be surprised if you go back to the solos that you just said you know you just know right and and especially the ones that you learned a long time ago because you've grown a lot since then Go back to those ones that you sort of reflexively play and just think about what's the uh, what's another position I could play that from. Um, maybe it's the same notes, but um, what's another what's another spot I could do that from, you know, even do it from the stairway to heaven solo. I know he didn't play it there, but you get the idea. It just forces you again out of your comfort zone. It puts your hand in a different place than it was, which means you need to you need to then move to another different place where you normally wouldn't go. And you need to allow yourself that feeling of being uncomfortable to be able to actually grow. You're creating new neural paths and you're allowing yourself to actually grow as a player. 
So, all right, so I'm gonna review these five. I'm gonna jump into the comments here in just a second. Again, let me know if there's other things that you've done besides what you've heard here today to, to um, get yourself out of the comfort zone that's worked for you. I'd love to share that. Okay, so the five that we talked about, go for a week without a pick. Don't allow yourself to play a cowboy chord for a while. Play the vocal melody when it comes to your uh, either a solo time or just not. Just learn songs that you know on guitar. Just learn the vocal melodies and play them and try and mimic the inflections that the vocal is doing. Um, listen to another instrument, play their parts on a guitar. I shared like clarinet is one for me that um, or saxophone, uh, find saxophone solos um, and play them on guitar. Um, and then question what you think you know, especially those solos and those parts that you learned um, when you were younger. Those are five ways to get yourself out of your comfort zone and uh, start your path on uh, some growth. <laughs> Mark says, Beck gave up the pick and never looked back. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Jeff Beck, he's kind of good. Um, Joe says, does Guitar Center sell neural pathways? No, <laughs> I don't think they do. Maybe Sweetwater does. Uh, the 70s were rough. Good to be here. Yep, good to see you, man. Joe also says, I do use the A and D triads all up and down. That's good. Yeah, knowing the triads um, of all your chords up and down the neck um, is key. You know, whenever you, again, we talked about playing an A. If you're not going to allow yourself to play that, play the little triad. There's a triad. There's a triad. There's a triad. Whoops. You get the idea. Triads. Okay, changes growth. Very true. Jigman 992. Jesse says, that's how I learned to play guitar was the song melody. There you go. And that's great. That's great. Nobody important says play the bass parts. That's interesting. That is interesting. <laughs> It's different, right? Mark Desaad says, I'm old, so every freaking day is an adventure. I hear you. With every day that passes for me, that is the case for me too, Mark. Daniel says, one thing I do to get out of my comfort zone is to learn tricky jazz progressions. Yes, yes, and that's an endless, that's an endless um, rabbit hole, <laughs> um, and one that I have not gone deep on at all. You know, someone who's exposed me to that, that's sort of a link for me, is um, Brian Setzer, because he plays everything, and he mixes it all together, including jazz, into all of that, and he's got crazy, crazy... Um, I don't know how crazy it's crazy to me anyway, crazy, um, you know, swing and jazzy runs and chord changes and things that he does with his, with his big band orchestra. And I love it, all things, Brian. So he was a link for me and all of that. And it's not natural for my ear to pick up on that stuff, but, but it was a comfort zone push to try and just learn some of his stuff. So I would agree with that, Daniel. They are crazy chords. There's this great book series called The Guitar Grimoire, or Grimoire, G-R-I-M-O-I-R-E. And there's a whole series of them. And I don't know the guy's name, the author. I think I saw them at Guitar Center. But I've had one for like 30 years. That Ted Green, I think is his name, I want to say. I may be wrong about that. 
I may be wrong about that, but um, but you'll you'll see them out there and every scale possible. It's super overwhelming, so you sort of don't know where to start. Uh, but you could just take that book, brrr, pick a page, and um, there's 30 new scales and modes and runs that you never saw before that are available to you. Um, and uh, it's one of those where I, I would stick with it for a little while, then I'd just be like, it's killing me, dude. It's overwhelming. But it's great information, It's a, and it's another place to sort of put your mind in, um, and it grabs a lot of folks. Joe, you're still here. I like to change my positions and fingering on pentatonics, three notes, a string and such. Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that too. Where you sort of limit yourself to the number of notes per string as an approach. Um, and uh, I've heard a lot of people talk about that. And that's, that's interesting. And I'm going to actually, I'm going to try that. I haven't really dove into lessons on that, but I've, I've heard that sentiment often. By the way, if you're curious about gear, I am running. One of these days I'll do, that's something you've asked me, and I have not done this. I will do a what's on my pedal board, because you might be surprised. Um, so I'm basically running a little bit of EQ, very, very little overdrive from a blues driver, a modded blues driver. And I run stereo out today into two amps. I'm running... Um, into that 63 basement a little bit and a 64 super reverb um, together. So I run both of both lines out on my stereo out on my pedal board because I love the sort of mix of a 10 inch speaker and a 12 inch speaker in the left, right. Um, I don't know if it, it's probably not coming across at all <laughs> with my little uh, PC microphone or whatever, but um, sounds good in the room. says another thing is to play super weird pedals anything from red panda super experimental makes me play totally weird things yeah i had a i did a video recently on going mobile the who song and he uses an envelope filter um wow, wow. you know um he used it into into his synth so he didn't use an actual envelope filter pedal but that i think is the effect um and you do that, you put that on your board, and then you're and then you're like, then you start playing those little parts from all the songs that you hear, Grateful Dead, um, using the envelope filter, and it makes you do different things with your hands. Um, what's that song? What I am is what I am. You what you are or what? that one from the late 80s but that was a that was one of those too yeah i agree it forces again it forces you to do different things you hear different things and you and your hands then approach your instrument differently all right um all right just a couple more and then i'm gonna wrap up here um i have the video of that very book guitar grimoire scales oh the video cool i'll have to look that up jesse that's good i didn't know that I tend to learn much faster with video and audio together, just for me. Some people need to read things. Some people need to hear things. Some people need to see them. Some people need to do them. It's sort of a mix of all of it, but I gravitate more to seeing and hearing, which is why I do these videos. I sort of made this channel because I would, I, I sort of make this channel because when I was 16 or 15 or 14, for learning guitar, what would I have wanted to see to teach me these songs? And that's sort of what I'm doing. Brian, love the channel. Thanks, bud. And I'm using frequently, bit of digression. Any exercises to build cohesiveness between players in a band? Keep doing what you're doing. Um, that's an interesting question. Exercises to build cohesiveness. 
I don't know anything other than just being very perseverant about songs and parts. So if you're playing in a band and you're working on something, if it's original or if it's a cover, whatever it is, you got to do those like endless repetitions. I've found if you're trying to get certain parts down, you know, if you're in more of a jam band where it's improv and it doesn't have to be the same every time, um, you know, I think nothing's going to replace just time and repetitions playing together. I, I don't know what else to offer other than that. Um, there's sort of no way around that unless you're all sort of virtuosos and you're listening to each other all the time and you're just um, able to sort of build off of one another. But that's what I have to say. Oh, actually, I hit on something there. Listening. Listening to each other. Um, so it's hard. You're focused on your instrument, but you got to listen to the other folks in the band. Everybody has to. The drummer has to listen to the vocalist. The drummer has to listen to the bass player. The bass player has to listen to the drummer. The bass player for sure needs to be mapping up to that kick drum. The guitar player for sure needs to be listening to what else is going on because if you're, if everybody's always playing all the time over everybody else, it's just a wall of noise and it's not working. Um, so that's the advice I'd give Brian. It's repetition and that everybody really needs to be listening to each other and allow yourself to not play in moments um, to give space for everybody. All right. All right, I just have to do that. Okay, so I think we're going to wrap it up. I hope you learned something new today. Um, I learned some stuff new and I really appreciate all the sharing in the chat. That was awesome. Um, so listen, we're going to do these once a month. Um, uh, check the description if you're looking for other ways to support the channel. And I love everybody that's weighing in here today. And thank you for watching um, the channel um, and offering all the great comments that you do. I really do appreciate it. I'm having a lot of fun with it and I hope you are too. So we're going to do these live streams once a, uh, once a month. And also, if you are a Patreon member, um, I do a separate live stream for Patreon members only, which is including different stuff that I don't hear, do here on the, on the big channel. So if you're so inclined and you'd like to join that, just pop down the link in the description there. You can join uh, my Patreon and be part of that too. And we'll talk about other stuff that the other folks don't hear. Okay. So until next time, all right, have a great weekend, everybody, and take care.